time I'd ever done too, really, in my the, in the time that I've been doing it. Good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. We're going to start off with our revival chorus, Let Revival Begin in Me. You can remain seated as we sing it out together. The words will be on the screen. Let's sing it out together. Lord, send revival. Start the work in me. Forgive my sin, cleanse within, this is my plea. Take my life and make me what you'd have me be. Lord, I surrender all, let revival begin in me. Let's sing it out once more together. Lord, send revival, start the work in me, forgive my sin, cleanse within, this is my plea. 
Take my life and make me what you have me be. Lord, I surrender all. Let revival begin in me. Amen. Very good singing. Good to see each one of you here tonight. I hope you've been enjoying your afternoon. I hope you like cold weather. It is. <clears throat> you know what? God answered a prayer today. Amen. We did. I know. I know. We had a little bit of snowflakes, a little bit of whatever. But look how nice and clear it is outside. Amen. Let's tr pray and trust the Lord and ask God to give us a great meeting. Uh, you remember, let's see, it's been a few years ago now. We had Dr. Comfort here and we got snowed out. Remember that? And then we had him come back and finish up the meeting later on. And so we are going to make it through this year. Amen? Amen. Was it uh, Charles Finney, I think, that said, uh, the way to have revival is to draw a circle on the floor and get in that circle and pray for everybody in that circle to get right with God and don't come out of the circle until everybody in the circle is right with God. And that's how you have revival. Amen? So let's draw our imaginary circle around ourselves tonight, amen? And just go ahead and start praying right now. In fact, if you got room in your circle, I'll get in it with you because I need a lot of prayer, amen? <laughs> a lot of prayer. Well, we're going to hear from our guest singers tonight in just a moment, the Barnes family. But I want to go ahead and mention to you about the, um, the incentive we had for tonight. And that uh, was young people in the young adult class tonight. Tomorrow night is ladies night. Tuesday night is men's night. Wednesday night is master club night. And the young person that uh, gets the most people here, gets the most points. We keep saying most people here, but the most points. And then on the final night is Sunday school night. And we're still doing it individually, but also the class that ends up with the best percentage overall will get a special uh, treat as well. I think we're, we said we're doing breakfast for the class. Donuts. Donuts for the class. Those kind of donuts that just looking at them, you put on a pound. Amen. And so we're going to do it up right for you in your class. And so we will deliver on the donuts. Uh, but here's the way it works. Regular attenders, that means people that come to the services on a regular basis, all right? That's more than Christmas and Easter. If you've seen them before, you know they come pretty regular. They're here, uh, that's an attender, a regular attender. They may not be a member of the church, but they're a regular attender. And they're, or church member, they're worth 500 points. Guests or visitors, that is someone that doesn't normally come to our church, uh, they're visiting for the first time or the first time in six months or whatever it might be. At least six months, I would say, would be a visitor. They're worth a 1,000 points. Everybody got that? 1,000 for visitors. How much for regular attenders? 500. Now, every member of a church should be a what? A regular attender. <laughs> I know what's going on around here now. <laughs> All right, so th be thinking about your points. Now, it's on the honor system. Brother Thomas may say more about this in just a moment, but that's the way it works. Now, do we have any first-time visitors that need a visitor's card tonight? If that's you, would you raise your hand? Anybody like that tonight? I'm looking around. All right, we have one right over here. Good, young man. Good to see you here. He's one of our Central Baptist folks. All right, and there's a young man back in the back there. Good. Praise the Lord. Two young men. I think the Lord's calling both these young men to preach. They have their hand in the air, and so that's good. We need more young men to preach the gospel. All right. Well, glad these young men are with us. There's a visitor's card in there. You fill that out and drop it off at the uh, Welcome Center at the back, and we have a gift for you. Yeah, we've got one coming to him, Brother Richard. Josh is just moving slow. See, he's got a little gray on the sides now. He's moving slower nowadays. And uh, all right. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad you're here. I hope you're glad to be here. And Brother Thomas will say more about this in a moment, and we will announce the winner. And you'll have to come and find me for the gift, or we'll give it to you. If you don't claim it, I'll spend it for myself. How's that? 
Amen. Thank you, Brother Bob. I like that. Well, let's ask the Lord's blessing on our service tonight, and then the Barnes family will be here to sing for us. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you and praise you for the privilege we had to be in church together tonight. Thank you, Lord, for holding off this bad weather, although I know that there's uh, some cold out there. Uh, we're thankful that we didn't get a bunch of snow and ice today, and we pray that you would keep it that way. Pray that you'd bless our service tonight. We pray that Christ would be honored and glorified. Be with Brother Thomas as he speaks in a few moments. And uh, bless the Barnes family as they minister to us through music. Lord, I know my heart was encouraged today uh, by just hearing them sing. And my heart was really encouraged by the message on the King of Grace. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for all you've done for us. And it doesn't even end here. Thank you for what we'll have in eternity with you. Now bless our time together tonight in the Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm in love with my Savior and He's in love with me. He is with me from day to day. What a friend is He. Watches over me while I sleep, hears me when I pray. I am happy as I can be, I now can say. Somebody loves me, answers my prayer. I love somebody, I know he cares. Somebody tells me not to repine. That somebody is Jesus and I know he's mine. You'll have joy that you never had, you then can say. Somebody loves me, answers my prayer. I love somebody, I know he cares. Somebody tells me not to repine. That somebody is Jesus and I know he's mine. At last, when our work is done, he will call us home to a mansion he has prepared, never more to roam. We'll sit down by the riverside, cares all passed away, and with never a pain to bear, what a happy day. Somebody loves me, answers my prayer. I love somebody, I know he cares. Somebody tells me not to repine. That somebody is Jesus and I know he's mine. That somebody is Jesus and I know he's mine. That somebody is Jesus and I know he's mine. My glad heart is singing by day and by night. My heart overflows with a wondrous delight. My joy I'll share with this sin weary rest.
has never been told. Heaven alone shall his glory unfold. And there he has gone to prepare me a place for I have been saved by grace. I'm saved, hallelujah, I'm saved, hallelujah, I'm saved by his wonderful marvelous grace. I'll sing of his love till I meet him above. For I have been saved by grace. For I have been saved by if you would with me and go to page number 538 page number 538 let's stand together and sing blessed be the name of the lord page number 538 all praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme who gave his son for man to die that he Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. And God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of man, once ruined by the fall, thou hast divine salvation's plan, for thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace. Of all the kingdoms conqueror, whose reign shall never cease. Sing it out. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Good singing, you may be seated as the barns come. I've been 
Sometimes you don't really appreciate the mountaintop till you've been in the valley for a little while. And so what a great song. And uh, all right, we're going to give away our first gift card, hopefully of many. And so tonight was teen and young adult night, and they got a full section over there. Now, if I'm preaching this way most of the evening, it's because y'all are all sitting over there, okay? That's okay. But what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and give out this first incentive. And so if you invited somebody and they're here... Because of your invitation, would you please stand? If you're a teenager or a young adult, wow, you have at least one friend. I'm so glad. <laughs> All right, now can you tell me, uh, we'll start with you, how many points do you have? A thousand points for first-time visitors and uh, 500 points for regular attender. 3,000 points. Do you have 3,000 points? You have 4,000 points. Now we're on the honor system, okay? Right? Miss Rhoda, you have a thousand points. And so it goes to how many did you have? Six thousand? Is that what you said? Four thousand. All right. So she's the winner. Give her a hand for that. All right. Good job. I'm glad that we didn't uh, have a tie. We'd have had to cut that in half and give that one to each of you. But, uh, but hey, if you're visiting, we're glad you're here too. And so she's got a gift card, and so she can take you out for a snack later. So just hit her up for that. So tomorrow night, tomorrow night is, uh, is going to be ladies' night. So ladies, be inviting, and uh, same deal. You be inviting, and, and uh, just get folks here. And you say, well, I've been inviting, and they may not come. Well, you just invite them, and at least give them an opportunity to come. And uh, it's a great opportunity just to get some, uh, some friends and maybe even some unsaved people here so they can hear the gospel and, uh, and just enjoy the services with us. Good job for inviting, and uh, Isaac, come lead us in song. All right. Well, I'll say one word. There is another way to help you uh, get folks here. If uh, Everybody likes to eat, right? 
And so we have uh, those meals that we'll be preparing for you. Uh, $3 a person, $15 family cap. And so that'll be a help to you. You can invite folks to come and say, hey, I'm going to feed you before the service at 6 o'clock. And uh, a great way to invite folks, you can sign up at the Welcome Center or you can sign up online. Either way, uh, you can sign up there and uh, take care of that. And if you bring somebody, you just call the church office. You say, hey, I got somebody coming with me. Call the church office. Let us know. That way we know how many to prepare for, all right? And that's every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, we'll have those meals prepared for you. All right, let's take our hymn books once more, if you would, and go to page number 319, page number 319, and let's stand together once more and sing, Set My Soul Afire, Lord, page number 319. Set my soul afire, Lord, for thy holy verse set my soul afire lord in my daily life amen i hope that's your prayer let's sing it as that way on the last verse let's sing it out together set my soul afire lord in my daily life far too long i've wandered in this day of strife nothing else will I will be your witness as you live in me. Set my soul afire. Set my soul afire. Make my life a witness of thy saving power. Millions grow in all. singing tonight let me say a word about the offering before we receive the offering and that is that this week you'll have an opportunity to be a real blessing to our 
uh, our own evangelist, Brother Thomas Engel and his family. Now, you can give to that tonight or any night, but I want you to pray about doing something special at least one night this week. We're going to be a blessing to our visiting singers as well, and we want to be a blessing to uh, our evangelist and speaker tonight. The Bible tells us not to muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And so if you want to get an evangelist stirred to really shuck the corn, give him a good love offering. Amen. Am I right, Brother Barnes? Amen. Amen. I heard a story one time, Brother Chuck Cofty told me about this, said he was sitting on the platform. This is all the way back when he was pastor, and I think he said it was Billy Kelly. And the offering had already totaled a great sum by the middle of the week. And he leaned over and told Brother Kelly what the offering, and Brother Kelly said, My sake in the morning. You folks are going to hear some preaching tonight. <laughs> so, just promise now to be a blessing. And boy, the preaching will get better and better. Amen. A lot of times you get out what you put into it. So if the evangelist wants a big offering, he needs to put a lot of money in, right? <laughs> Amen. I like to make you laugh because the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Amen. We're not going to say our verse tonight. I want to give you a thought tonight that God gave me this afternoon. I was reading Luke 24. And you know what? No matter what happens in this life, the tomb is still empty. <laughs> That's a blessing right there. Amen. And I'm looking forward to what God has for us tonight. Let's be a blessing to Brother Engel and be a blessing uh, to those that are visiting with us as well tonight. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on this offering. Father, we just want to praise you and thank you tonight again for all you've done for us. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, but it didn't stay dead. It didn't stay on the cross. Many people wear a crucifixion or a cross, a crucifix. And Lord, uh, that, that's not where it's at. It's in that empty tomb. There's victory there, and we thank you for it. We pray tonight that you would just uh, allow us to sense that victory in your presence. I pray, God, that you would stir us, help us, and strengthen us. We pray that you give Brother Engel liberty tonight as we open the Word of God in just a few moments. May our hearts be stirred and challenged and helped, and we'll praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's going to be a lot of words in this song, so you're going to have to listen closely. He died for me. <clears throat> I saw one hanging on a tree in agony and blood. He fixed his languid eyes on me As near his cross I stood Oh, can it be upon a tree The Savior died for me My soul is thrilled, my heart Never 
till my latest breath can I forget that look it seemed to charge me with his death though not a word I spoke my conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair I saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there oh can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me my soul is thrilled my heart is filled to think he died for me alas I knew not what I did but now my tears are vain where shall my trembling soul be hid for I the Lord have slain a second look he gave which said I freely all forgive this blood is for thy ransom paid I die that thou mayst live oh can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me my soul is thrilled my heart is filled to think he died for me my soul is thrilled my Amen. Thank you, Brother David. Wow, what a great song. Please take your Bibles, turn to Ecclesiastes. I'm going to dismiss the children, not the childlike, but the children, fourth grade, down to three years old. You can follow Miss Ingle out. There the saints go marching out, and uh, they'll be in meetings all this week, and Sarah will be uh, teaching them, and they'll be going through all kinds of Bible lessons and object lessons, and so uh, they'll be excited when they get out tonight, and they'll be excited about coming back tomorrow. And uh, we appreciate you bringing your children. Ecclesiastes in your Bible tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter number one. My soul is thrilled to think he died for me. And uh, if I'd have been the only person ever born, ever to breathe God's air, the only person, Jesus would have still came and died for me. There's no other way. And uh, if you were to be the only person, that would be the same for you. And so glad you're here tonight. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the meal today. I enjoy every time I come home and we have a fellowship like that. I love it. The hardest thing really is deciding what to eat because it's all so good. And then you get to the dessert table and I'm watching some of the uh, more wise men that have been around for a little bit longer. And uh, like Brother Allen, I was watching him and I was watching a couple other people trying to figure out what dessert they were going to go for because they know, you know, they know if something's on the table that maybe their wife made or somebody else made. And so I had, uh, I followed Brother Allen's leadership and I had some banana pudding. And I'm not going to tell you which bowl. There was like three bowls of banana pudding. But uh, you better wear two pairs of socks when you come to fellowship because one of them's going to get knocked off when you eat pudding like that. It was really good. And, uh, and I enjoyed it and then went home and relaxed a little bit, just kind of didn't go to bed, didn't go take a nap, but I, you know, to be honest with you, after traveling for a couple days, and then yesterday was a pretty big and exciting day, and then this morning was a pretty good morning, I just wanted to kind of relax and snuggle my wife. I had my lovely wife on one side, and I had a lazy dog on the other side of me, and you don't want to get those two mixed up, that's trouble, okay? 
a lovely dog and a, well, you know, we, we might have to turn this into a marriage conference if we talk about that. But uh, good afternoon, and uh, just so glad to be here, and uh, glad the young people are here. And I'm impressed every time I come and see some growth, and uh, last time we were home, you guys sang the teen choir, it sounded phenomenal. And uh, I appreciate y'all, and tonight, I'm just going to be honest, I'm preaching generally to everybody, but specifically, I am preaching to the young people tonight. I'm preaching to y'all, so y'all listen up, and there'll be a quiz at the end of the, the sermon, and so... Anyway, you take good notes, you don't have to worry about it. But let's begin reading in Ecclesiastes chapter number 1. Ecclesiastes chapter number 1. In verse number 1, the Bible says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now, who would this be? It'd be Solomon. Solomon was known for his wisdom, and he was known for his wealth, and he was known for his many wives. And so, I believe this is at the end of Solomon's life. Certainly, God is using his personality, and God is using him to pen these words. But this is Solomon at the end of his life. Now, Solomon is known for a lot of things, but he messed up. And uh, I believe this is Solomon at the end of his life, and uh, he's gathering maybe a group of young people together, and he's saying, look, these are some things I learned. And uh, he says in verse number 2, he says, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And uh, he's, he's kind of putting forth the idea that life, and uh, it certainly can be this way if you're not careful, is just like chasing the wind. You, you think you can get it, and, and you just don't get it. It's vain. And he says, uh, One generation passes away, and another generation cometh, but... The earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. And the winds goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and, and the wind returneth again according uh, to his circuit. So it's talking about just kind of how life revolves. And there's seasons, and things change, and things pass away, and things come back up on the scene uh, again. And that's what he's conveying. He says in verse number 7, All rivers uh, run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. It seems like we always want just a little bit more. Would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Father, we're going to open up the Scriptures tonight and, and ask that you would help us. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would work. I pray that you would help me to communicate clearly the burden of my heart. Uh, Lord, these young people are the next generation of leaders, of husbands, of wives, of preachers, missionaries. And uh, Lord, uh, some of us are enjoying our time, but Lord, the fact of the matter is... Our time's going to come to an end, and somebody else is going to have to take the mantle. And I pray, God, that you would work in the hearts of the young and old alike tonight. And, and Lord, help us not to waste our time and resources. We have such a short time on earth to prepare for eternity. And, God, I pray that you'd help us to have sober thoughts toward this tonight. And we thank you for your love. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you that, Lord, if I was the only one, you'd have died for me. And, uh, Lord, you died in my place. Help me to live in your place. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but I enjoy technology. I, uh, we live in our trailer, we drive a truck, and uh, all of my preacher friends think I know how to do mechanical stuff because I'm always fixing it. They're like, what are you doing? Well, I'm fixing this this week, and I'm fixing that this week. And they said, boy, I didn't really know you learned how to fix things. I didn't know you were mechanical. And the secret is, is I'm really, I'm not. There's a saying called necessity is the mother of invention. And uh, you just got to figure out a way to get it, uh, get, to get it done. And uh, I'm thankful. I got an iPhone, and uh, I can get on my iPhone. And if I don't know how to do it, uh, certainly there's somebody on YouTube that's done it before. And how many of you have gone to YouTube to find some kind of video to help you repair something or make something? So I'm not the only one. And, uh, and I've, I've kind, to, kind of learned to, to gauge how long a project is going to take. Uh, for instance, a few weeks ago, we were changing out the wheel bearings on 
uh, the front of our truck, and, and I knew it was the one coming from the driver's side. I knew it because when you, when you turn, you could hear it stop making a noise or vice versa, and so I didn't want to pay a mechanic to change the wheel bearing, and so you know what I did? I got on YouTube. And uh, the, video, the, the video was probably about 12 minutes long. And so I know from experience that it's going to take me a lot longer than 12 minutes. You know, they got the shop, they got the lift, they got the tools. And so for every 10 minutes that video is, I add two hours. So if it's a 10-minute job on YouTube, it's going to take me two hours. If it's a 20-minute job, it's going to take me four hours. And you get the picture. And so it's a useful thing. And, and, uh, and I like going to it. It saves me, uh, number one, it saves me some money. But number two, I always learn something. And uh, as I think about those instructional videos, I wish that when I was a teenager and when I was a single young adult, I wish that somebody would have had an instructional video on how not to waste your life. And uh, maybe people tried to reach out to me and I was just too stubborn or not paying attention. But tonight, that's the title of the message, How to waste your life. Now, nobody wants to waste their life. Uh, you want to have, hopefully, the most fulfilling life that you can. Well, Solomon comes onto the pages of Scripture here in Ecclesiastes, and you know what? He is being totally, totally honest. He says in verse number 2, he says, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanities. And if you and I are not careful, we'll live maybe even a peaceful existence on planet earth, and one day it's all going to come to a close. And uh, you're going to stand and give an account to God. And uh, there's a real possibility that many will stand before God and realize this, I have wasted my life. And Solomon's just telling you how not to do it. Notice what he says in verse number 12, first uh, there, there, chapter 1 and verse number 12, the Bible says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And he says in verse 13, I gave, and I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sort of veil hath God given to the sons of men to be exercised therewith. Now, some young people and some old alike, I know pastor's taking some classes right now, working on his master's degree, and, and praise God for that. He's working hard, uh, but it's, it's, it's a toil. And uh, there's some people that got some uh, midterms coming up in college, and it's hard to, to kind of prepare for those things, and it's tiresome, and, and, and that's the way it is. Verse 14, Solomon says, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of the Spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. He says in verse 16, I commune with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I foresee that this also is vexation of the Spirit. So number one, if you want to waste your life, just spend your whole life pursuing worldly wisdom. Several times he says here, I gave my heart to know what? To know wisdom. Now, none of you students go home and said, hey, the preacher said school's not important. It is. And you ought to get all you can, and you ought to can all your, you get. But worldly wisdom is not the most important thing. Hey, if you get to go to college, praise God you go to college. I hope you get some education that you can use and apply to, to every day life. But this is the mistake that some people make. They put academics above the authority of the Word of God. And Solomon, he was known as what? A wise man. And uh, he had it all put together. And you can read his testimony in the Scriptures. But you know what? He gets to the end of it, you know, and he says, I gave my heart to know wisdom and it was all vanity and vexation of the Spirit. And uh, I think the world will kind of drag you down that way. Uh, they'll put some things out there and make it look real good, the bright lights and some glimmer and the glory, and, and you think, boy, i got to learn about that, and you learn about that, and you know what? It leaves a bad taste in your mouth sometimes. 
I like reading biographies, and this year I've been reading some biographies on some presidents. I've read some biographies on uh, President John F. Kennedy. I read some biographies on uh, Truman. I've read some biographies on Theodore Roosevelt. I've read a biography on Ronald Reagan. And I thought I needed to learn about these presidents, and I did learn some things about them. But you know what? After I finished reading those biographies on some presidents, uh, it left a bad taste in my mouth. And uh, my esteem didn't go up. It went down. And uh, worldly wisdom sometimes will do that. And Solomon says, hey, if you want to waste your life, pursue worldly wisdom. He said it's all vanity and vexation of the Spirit. The Bible says this, Proverbs 1 and verse 7, the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of knowledge. Beginning of wisdom, beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So, so, young people, uh, when it comes to this education, this idea of education, there are some people that are going to sound smarter than they really are. And uh, don't let them fool you and uh, try to raise doubt in your mind of the authority of the Bible. Don't pursue worldly wisdom. Solomon says it's vanity and vexation of the Spirit. You continue down, the Bible continues. He says in... Uh, verse number uh, 1 of chapter 2, he says, I said in my heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with myrrh, therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this is also vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? Verse 3, I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what is that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heavens all the days of their life. So, so Solomon says, hey, I gave my heart to know wisdom, and it was a waste. It left a bad taste in my mouth. Uh, I gave my heart to know, uh, you could call this point number two, loose living. I gave my heart to learning, and then I gave my heart to loose living. You know, folks end up in college all the time, and boy, they got a plan, and they're going to go, and they're going to study. And a lot of times, if they're not care careful, they'll come out more confused than when they went in. And uh, sometimes your view of life gets jaded. And you start to learn about life a little bit. You say, you know what? I didn't sign up for this. And you kind of go to, to, from one extreme to the other. Maybe somebody's a scholar, and they're a student. Man, they're in an Ivy League school, and they start learning some more about life and say, boy... This ain't how I thought it was going to be. And you know what? They do a pendulum swing all the way other, to the other side, and they go from living a, a pursuit of learning to living a life of a pursuit of totally loose living. From one extreme to the other. And uh, if you're not careful, you'll treat life as a game. And you'll find out when you get to the end, it's not a game. And uh, life's not about having fun. And boy, God wants us to have fun. Those things are important. But... If we're not careful, we will waste our life with the pursuit, pursuit of learning and the pursuit of loose living. He says, I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine. Uh, somebody's trying to make a case uh, always for the Christian and social drinking. And, and, uh, and if you think that the Bible promotes social drinking, I like what one preacher said. He said, you need to sue your brain for non-support. Uh, but I know the sinfulness of my own heart and the sinfulness of heart of man. And you know what? We can take the Bible and justify anything we want to do. But Solomon said, I gave my heart to that. The social scene, kind of relaxing, live, laugh, and love. Hey, don't worry about it. Just cruise down on easy street. And you know what he says? It was vanity and vexation of the Spirit. It was a waste. He continues. Notice what he says in verse number 4. He says, I made me great works. I builded me houses and, and planted me vineyards. By the way, young people, let me remind you, 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse number 12, this is to the younger generation, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. And uh, sometimes the young people look to the old people for the example, and rightly so we ought to be. But you know what, young people? 
You have just the same responsibility to set a godly example. And Solomon says, I, I made me great works. I built me houses. I planted me or gardens and orchards and planted trees of them and all kinds of, of fruits. I made me pools of water to, to water therewith the wood therein that bringeth forth the trees. You know what? Solomon wasn't this kind of king that sat on the throne at the gate of the city and just kind of had a stern look on his face all day. No, this guy was industrious. I mean, Solomon was trying to find purpose in life. He tried to find it in learning. Uh, he tried to find it in loose living. He tried to find it in labor. I mean, he was into agriculture. He was into irrigation. Uh, notice the Bible says in uh, verse number 6, I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. And, and also I had great possessions of great and small cattle of all that were in Jerusalem before me. So he was into all kinds of stuff. And uh, if you're not careful, your work can become a distraction. Now let me qualify my statement. In America is built on hard work from all kinds of people. We are, by and far, have been historically an industrious people. And uh, we ought to be working people. God, the Bible says if a man doesn't work, a man doesn't eat. But you understand there's balance. And the there's a temptation that as you grow older in life, and these people that have been there can attest to it, that your work, your labor, can become a major distraction, and you might be a successful businessman, or a businesswoman, or a doctor, and you might be successful in the professional area and be a failure at home. And uh, if you're not careful, you'll become a workaholic. And there's sometimes you've got to put the work in. But you understand you've got to keep it in balance. Solomon said, I tried to find the purpose of life in learning. I tried to find the purpose of life in loose living. It was vanity and vexation of the spirit. I gave myself to labor, to agriculture, to, to irrigation, to, uh, to animals. He says, notice uh, what he says in verse number uh, 8. He says, uh, towards the end of the verse, he says, I got me men singers and women singers and, and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and, and that of all sorts. So he was into the liberal arts. He was into the, the fine arts. Solomon was trying to find the purpose of life in all these things. And uh, you know what he says when he gets to the end? Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Doesn't sound like a very good story, does it? Well, it gets better. He continues and he says in verse number 8, he says, I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of the kings of the provinces. Look at verse number 9. Uh, so I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Verse 10, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. And so you could say he pursued learning. You could say he pursued loose living. Uh, you could say that he pursued labor. You could say that he pursued luxury. I mean, he got him silver and gold. I like to ask young people, I ask them, I say, what are you planning on doing after your you get out of high school or after you get out of college. And most of them say, I don't know. And that's good. That's, that's fine, you know. Uh, but a lot of them have this idea. I want to get out and I want to get a job and I want to make a lot of what? Money. You see, in America, uh, we, we make the error of equating money with success. And uh, you, you never associate money with success because you can be a rich failure. And, uh, and Solomon says, uh, there was nothing I withheld from my eyes. Whatever my heart desired, I could have it, and I got it, and it was vanity and vexation of the Spirit. He gave himself to luxury. It's interesting. Uh, we like the American dream, don't we? Now, when you hear that phrase, the American dream, what do you think of? What we think about a nice house? There's nothing wrong with a nice house and maybe the, the proverbial white picket fence, you know, and, and uh, boy, we got maybe a couple of kids and we're raising our kids and, and then we're thinking about college and 
Then we're thinking about retirement. It's a reality. I mean, this happens every single day. But you know what? The American dream, if not kept in the right priorities, is a facade. And the American dream, you know what it could could quickly become? The American nightmare. Solomon said, I gave my life for learning and loose living and labor. I was a workaholic. I gave my heart to luxury, everything I wanted, my heart's desire, I had it. And you know what he concludes? It was all vanity and vexation of the Spirit. He says in verse 11, Then I looked on all the works that I, my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of the Spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Take your Bibles and fast forward just a couple of chapters to Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. Ecclesiastes chapter number 5, in verse number 10. Solomon writes and says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. You know what God's saying? If your heart's desire is money, then guess what? It's not going to fulfill. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver nor he that loveth abundance of increase, this is also vanity. Verse 11, When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is it to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? You know, the more you got, somebody once said this, more money, more problems. And uh, people will come out of the woodwork to try to get what you have. And, And the Bible says there in verse number 12, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little, Or much. What's that mean? Hey, when you get out there and you go to work and you just work and you have a clean conscience before God and man, whether you have little or whether you have a lot, guess what? You can pillow your head at night and you can sleep like a baby. That's priceless. But the Bible says here, the sleep of of a laboring man is sweet whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. You know why? The anxiety. Man, how can I keep what I got? You know, everybody's coming to get it, and and boy, I don't want to let it go. How can I keep it? And they lay in bed all night, struggling with anxiety and and, and all kinds of stress on how to maintain what they have. And, And Solomon says, hey, I gave my heart to no luxury. I had it all. I had everything. And it was vanity and vexation of the spirit. Verse 13, There is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. You know what that challenges me to be? A giver. I mean resources. God wants to use you as a vessel. I'm not talking about just money. Hey, if we would tithe our time, just think about that. If we would give God 10% of our time, boy, he'd have a lot, wouldn't he? And, uh, boy, if we'll just invest, and sometimes we hold back so much. And you know what? You know who it hurts? It hurts me. And Solomon's just, he's just being real. He's just saying the American dream is not all that dreamy, really. It's the American nightmare. And if we're not careful as Christians, what we'll do is we'll live and we'll try to create this utopia here on earth that's really a facade. And all we really do is make the world a better place to go to hell from. And life's not a game. And life's not short. And life's about preparing for eternity, preparing to meet God. And Solomon says, I went down this, man, it was vanity. I went down this, and it was vanity. And so take your Bibles and turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7, verse 25. He says, I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. I find more bitter than death the woman. Now, I was just reading in first or second, first Kings chapter number 11, and the Bible says that Solomon loved many strange women. He loved the Moabites. And he loved the Zidonians and the Ammonites and the Hittites. And and he was always going after women that he had no business going after. But you see this pursuit of his life? You could call it the pursuit of lust. He mentions ladies here. And he says about the ladies that he was chasing after, I find more bitter than death the what? The woman. Now he's not talking about a Sarah 
or he's not talking about a Hannah or an Abigail. He's not talking about that type of godly woman. And when the Bible talks about a strange woman and how Solomon loved many strange women, they were women that were strange to the things of God. And they turned his heart. And so, young people, I'll make this application for everybody. Don't get caught up pursuing the wrong relationship. It doesn't matter how attractive they are. It doesn't matter how, uh, how well they might sing. Uh, if, they're not, if their feet aren't pointed in the right direction and pointed towards God, hey, somebody once said this, it's better to want something that you don't have than to have something that you don't want. And that applies to a lot of things. And Solomon's just being real. He says, I gave my heart to lust. I mean, he's known for the number of wives and concubines. What a terrible, terrible thing. And he says, I gave my heart to that whole scene, and it was vanity. I gave my heart to learning, and it was vanity. I gave my heart to loose living, and it was vanity, to luxury, vanity. Boy, I was a workaholic, man. I tried to get my fix and fulfillment by working real hard. You know what he said? It's vanity. You think he's communicating the truth to us? Now take your Bibles and let's look at one more chapter. Turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Ecclesiastes number 12 and verse number 1. Remember, what's the next word? Now. Sometimes the temptation is to wait until you get to the next phase of life before you make that next step, before you make that, next, make that next big decision. And you know what? When you need to make that decision, you need to make it right now. Uh, one big decision could cover a, little, a lot of little small decisions. And uh, Solomon said, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Now, he calls God the what? The creator. He has ability, and he has something else. He has authority. He holds you, figuratively speaking, in the palm of his hand. And uh, he loves you. He sent his son to die for you. He has a plan and a purpose for every individual here. And you know what? He created you, and he has authority over you. And Solomon's just being truthful. He says, uh, Remember now the Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Young people and old alike, if you're not careful, you know what will happen? Some bad things might happen in your life. We all make bad decisions. And uh, we, sometimes we make more than one, or two, or three, or four. And we get ourselves in trouble, and... We're not right with God, and we begin to grow old. And you know what begins to happen? That root of bitterness begins to take root in your heart. And ultimately, we blame everybody but ourselves for the problems that we have and the situation. And ultimately, you know who we try to blame? God. And you know what? The end days are miserable. And you probably know people right now that ought to be in church tonight. But you know what? They, they've not... They've not pursued a relationship with God. And right now, they are miserable. The evil days. The Bible says in verse 2, when the, While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble. Now, this is talking about the physical aging process, I think. And uh, I'm 43 years old, and, and I feel pretty good most of the time. But sometimes when I'm writing or in the morning I'll be reading, if I hold my hand up, you know what will start happening? It'll start trembling like that, you know. And I'm like, stop it. And uh, that's weird, you know. You, you get, kind of get used to stuff like that. But you know what? When the Bible says, and the keepers of the house shall tremble, you know what it's talking about? Your bones. You just start trembling. There's one day if the Lord Jesus tarries or he doesn't take you home first, young people, you won't be young forever. And uh, you better serve God now. You better just make the call and do it right now. The Bible says, uh, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few. Now, what's the grinders? That's your teeth. You know, once you lose your adult teeth, they don't grow back. And uh, the grinders, boy, they're, 
they're ceasing, they're few. And the Bible says, And those that look out of the windows be darkened, and the door shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird. I, I really don't know. I, I read this, and I was really meditating on it. And I think that, you know, when you just get older and the bones start to tremble and the eyes don't work like they're supposed to and, and, uh, and, and things just aren't working the way that you, you'd like for them to work, well, sometimes you just go to bed early. You know, you go to bed before the sun goes down. And then at, at the sound of a little bird, you know what? You just sleep so light, you just wake up. And uh, then the Bible says there in uh, verse number 5, And when they shall be afraid of that which is high... And, they sh and when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall uh, be in the way, and, and the almond tree shall flourish. I was thinking about this. When I was in my 20s, I worked on 50-story buildings on the outside. I loved it. I would be out there with safety ropes on scaffolding and, and putting in glass and, and just enjoying my life. If I get on an eight-foot step ladder, now I'm like, boy, you got to be careful. <laughs> you know? One step at a time. Don't go on that stop top, you know, and so the older you get, I don't know, maybe you just understand more what could potentially happen, but, boy, those fears are there. I don't want to go that high. It makes me afraid. The Bible says, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and the desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Well, let's fast forward. Let's go down to verse number 13. So Solomon's closing it up. And he's just coming clean. And he's just releasing the burden of his heart. I've pursued all these areas. I've pursued the American dream, and it wasn't a dream at all. It was a nightmare. And you say, well, what do you do? What do you do with your life? Well, it's pretty simple. Look at verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God... And keep his commandments. You know what we need a revival of? We need a revival of the fear of God. I mean, I read an article just the other day where there's some kind of churches, and I wouldn't call them a church. And you know what they're putting in their lobby? A bar to serve beer in a church. I wouldn't call that a church. And there's some churches, you know, and I know everybody's different, and I'm not trying to push a standard, but somebody told me one time, you never criticize anybody for, have a high, for having higher dress standards or music standards or whatever than you have. They're trying to protect themselves. And, uh, and you know what? I wouldn't go to a church if the preacher didn't have enough reverence and fear for God to wear a suit. Now, does a suit make you spiritual? Not really, but there's this idea that, uh, that God and man can just kind of merge together and we're on the same level, and that's not true. He is the creator. And so what's the Bible say? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Live your life like one day you will stand before God. Now, if you're here, and young person, you probably have a small percentage of being a millionaire if that's your goal. A small percentage. But can I tell you, you have a 100% chance of standing before the Lord Jesus Christ one day. 100%. You're going to stand. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. It's really not how much we know. It's about how much we obey. And the fact of the matter is, it's a very dangerous place to be to know a lot about God and don't obey God. What's the conclusion of the whole matter? Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You say, who am I going to marry? Don't worry about it, just fear God and obey. And you'll marry exactly who you're supposed to marry. You say, well, what kind of job am I going to have? Don't worry about it, just fear God and to obey his commandments. And you'll have just the job that God wants you to have. And uh, you know what? There might be a young fellow in here that maybe God's called to preach. And, and uh, maybe you've been distracted with these other pursuits. Learning and loose living and luxury. And God has called you just as sure as you're sitting here and you're distracted. You know what you need to do? Fear God and obey. It's just really easy, isn't it? Husbands, fear God and obey. Wives, fear God. And obey. And you'll be exactly where God wants you to be. But don't be distracted by pursuits that will waste your life. 
I read about this king. His name was Charles the Great. And uh, his fancy French name was called Charlemagne. Anybody ever heard of Charlemagne? And uh, Charlemagne was known to have a magnificent court, almost like Solomon. I mean, people came from all over to see Charlemagne and all of his greatness and in all his royalty. When Charlemagne died, he gave specific instructions, very unusual. He said, when I die, I want you to bury me and set me on my throne. And I want you to take my royal robes and I want you to put them around my shoulders. I want you to put the crown on my head. And I want you to put a sword in my hand. And that's the way he wanted to be buried. And you know what? One day he did die. And so uh, to his uh, request, they prepared him for burial and they put him in a tomb and they put him on his throne. And they put those purple robes around his shoulders and they put that crown on his head and they put a sword in his hand and then they closed it up. Well, a couple of hundred years later, there was a new king in town and uh, he didn't really have that much respect for Charlemagne. So he said, hey, let's crack that old tomb open and see how Charlemagne's doing in there. And so he gave the command and certainly they got some guys and, and they began to wedge that tomb open and they opened it up and boy, it was all dusty and dark in there and cobwebs and, and guess what? Sure enough, Charlemagne was there. And uh, there he was and, and uh, he was just a skeleton now and, and uh, the way the story goes, he still had that rattered and tattered royal robe around his shoulders. He still had that crown on his, on his head, just cocked to the side a little bit, and, and he had a sword in one hand, and the way the story goes, the other hand had a bony finger, and it was pointing at a verse in the New Testament. And this was the verse. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world yet lose his own soul. Young people, my heart breaks for our country. Our heart breaks for our churches. And you know what? The mantle's about to fall, and it's going to fall from one generation to the next. And can I encourage you and challenge you? Fear God and keep His commandments. Fear God and keep His commandments. And if you'll do that, You'll be right where God wants you to be, and I promise you, you will have a fulfilling life. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Would you bow your head and pray with me, please? In just a moment, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to close the service. Now, generally, I'm preaching to everybody, but specifically, I'm preaching to the young people tonight. And young people, in just a moment, when we have our invitation, I'm going to invite you to come and commit to God that you're going to fear Him and obey Him. Now, that's a big challenge, and don't take it lightly. Somebody said, well, I tried Christianity, but it offered too little. I don't think that's the problem. I think it demands too much. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so here's the invitation, young, young person, old alike. If you're here tonight and you say, by the grace of God, I'm not perfect, but I'm deciding right now that I'm going to fear God and keep His commandments. To the best of my ability, by the grace of God, I'm going to fear God and keep His commandments. You just slip your hand in the air and say, I'm making that commitment. To the young people, I challenge you, one big decision will cover a lot of the little decisions. I'm going to fear God and keep his commandments. Thank you. You can put your hands back down. I see hands all in different places of the auditorium, okay? This is what I'm going to challenge you to do. When we begin the invitation song, I want you to come, and I want you to pray, and I'm going to invite you to commit to God. I'm going to fear him, and I'm going to keep his commandments. If you're here tonight and you've never been born again, I want to invite you to come and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Tonight's not been primarily a gospel night, but certainly, boy, hey, the same's for you. Fear God and keep His commandments. But maybe you've been caught up in all these different pursuits, and it's been a waste and left a bad taste in your mouth. Can I tell you, God can start life over brand new for you. You come. There'll be pastors here when we start our invitation. If you need help, you come get help. You young people, you commit to the Lord on your knees. I will fear God and keep His 
commandments. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you, we love you, and we thank you, Lord. And I pray that our commitments would not be weak. Lord, I pray that they would be rooted. And uh, Lord, I pray that we would go forward in confidence. And Lord, we have a perfect Bible that has just challenged us that, Lord, a lot of things that we spend a whole life pursuing are really just a waste. And I pray, God, that you would speak to the heart of every person here, and especially these young people, and help them to make up their minds to fear you and just obey. And Lord, I believe that this will bring results that will affect not just this generation, but the generations to come. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the testimony of Solomon. But Lord, we thank you for the testimony of our Lord Jesus. The Lord who was victorious. He's not in the grave. And uh, Lord, help us to give everything to you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me with heads bowed and eyes are closed? I'm going to invite you, if you're here and you'd say, hey, I'm going to do my dead level best to fear God and keep his commandments. When the pianist begins to play, I want to challenge you. I invite you to come. Come and just kneel down and give your heart to the Lord. When the pianist plays, you come. If you meant it, you come. Pastor Cutshaw's here. If you need somebody to pray with you, Brother Isaac's here. You just grab somebody and say, hey, would you pray with me? If you're here and you're not born again, would you come? Would you come and just, hey, somebody uh, can take you and take the Bible and show you how you could be born again, that you can be saved. If you have a need, you come and you talk to the pastor. This is a time that you can get some help. Praise God for some committed young people. Maybe there's somebody here, there's a young man that God's called you to preach and you've been distracted by vain pursuits. And it's time to get back on track. Will you come? Will you come and let somebody pray with you and just have some help and, and just say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm going to fear you and keep your commandments. You just come. sing a verse of this song while these folks that have come are still praying. I hope you'll pray for our young people tonight. Think about this thought. Don't you wish you'd have heard that when you were their age? Pray that God will root it in their heart tonight. Brother Isaac's going to lead us in a couple of verses and we'll close our invitation tonight. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender
Amen. Everybody look this way for just a moment, if you would. Just a couple of closing thoughts before we're dismissed with a word of prayer. Don't forget, tomorrow night is what? Well, that was weak, man. That was weak as water poured out all, all over the ground. Here we go. One more time. Tomorrow night is? Ladies' night. Very good. If you're a lady, raise your hand. Let's have our ladies raise their hands. All the, all the girls ought to have their hand up. You should be a lady. Amen. I know that's, that's what society needs, some more ladies. Don't miss the easy points. Look around, see who's not here. 500 points for a regular attender, 1,000 points for a visitor. Think about all the people you know that go to a different church. Call them and say, hey, you got to come and help me tomorrow night. Now, our young ladies can get in this, too. So you get a double shot at winning a $20 gift card, you know. And so work hard at it. Uh, 1,000 points for visitors, uh, 500 points for uh, regular attenders. Now, somebody told me this. I think, is this right? Callie, is today your birthday? And your sister took that $20 gift card for me. I think she should give it to you for your birthday. Happy birthday. I failed to mention that this morning. Happy birthday to Callie Hogan. And so she turned 16. Everybody watch out on the road. Amen. All right. So happy birthday. I failed to mention that this morning. Tomorrow night, ladies' night. Uh, let me mention this, please. Pray for Mark and Katie Craddock. I didn't mention that this morning. Brother Mark did not get good news on this last visit. His cancer is back, and we really need to just lift them up to the Lord in prayer. A lot of prayer needs that are facing our uh, many of our folks right now, and we'll keep you posted on everything we know about. But please just continue to pray for them. We're going to be dismissed the word of prayer. We want the birds to slip on back there to their table. Uh, brother Isaac, brother uh, Thomas, you slip back. Isaac has an announcement. Uh, for just for all the parents, uh, the afterglow will be done at 9 o'clock. We'll be right here at the church. All right. Brother Mike Cagle, if you would, lift your voice and dismiss us tonight.